Welcome everybody. I'm Dolores Vest. I own Book No Further with my husband Craig Coker and we are delighted tonight to have Brooke with us. Book No Further is a independent bookstore in downtown Roanoke. We're the only one for about 40-50 miles around so if you're in the Roanoke area please come see us. Um, Brooke uh, came to me several months ago and was real excited that her third book was coming out and we are glad we get to help her launch that today. Um, I think from what Brooke has said after seeing the registration list that many of you know her already. So some of this is probably uh, going to not be a surprise to you, but um, Brooke is, has passion for ancient history and that's what got her talking uh, about um, Mark Antony, which we all know through uh, legends and movies and um, his romance with Cleopatra. And if you've read the first two books, you've learned a whole lot more. And I hope you're en enjoying those. Um, one of the things I'm fascinated with is Brooke traveled to Italy to work on these. We have a lot of authors who do historic fiction, but don't get into it that deep. And I think that's what makes these books uh, particularly special. Uh, Brooke has a degree in uh, music education and she teaches that in Body Talk County Schools. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, which is near Roanoke. And I am going to, at this point, turn this over to Kurt, who is going to introduce her. Uh, is, I mean, I'm sorry, he's going to interview her and uh, if you have questions, we've received some in advance, uh, and we'll ask those in just a little bit. If you have other questions, please put them in the chat function, and then we will uh, read them out in a little bit. And also, uh, we're going to have a couple people sharing the stage here with Brooke, who are going to be reading from her book. So uh, sit back and enjoy, and we'll go from here. You can take it there, Kirk. Thanks, Dolores. Um, I could introduce Brooke if you'd like me to. I know her pretty well, but I'll just stick to interviewing for tonight. Hey, Brooke. Hi, Kurt. It's good to see you. You too. Hey, tell me, where does all this interest come from um, for Rome and for Mark Antony? Where do you get that from? It started in a classroom back in my high school sophomore year, and uh, my class was reading Julius Caesar, and I was just floored. I was fascinated by Roman culture and the story, and I started digging and reading more on my own, and it just became something that I really enjoyed. And as time passed, uh, of course, I became a music teacher, and the thought of writing a novel for that period kind of got pushed on the back burner. And uh, finally, when I went to get my master's, instead of going into music education, I got a Master of Arts in Liberal Studies with an emphasis on ancient history, historical fiction, that type of, or so, sorry, not historical fiction, but Roman history. And uh, so it, one thing led to another, and once I was done with my master's, I thought, well, I'm in my 40s now, maybe I should go ahead and start a novel. So that's where it all began. <laughs> and um, so everybody knows how the story ends, right? And um, so what would make it compelling for me to read, at least? Why would I want to read that? Why is this different for you? Well, first of all, it is part of a trilogy. And um, hopefully, by the time you read the first two, you're hooked. And you, of course, want to read the rest of it. I think what makes my work a lot different is that it is from Marcus Antonius's point of view. Um, he was a very controversial uh, man historically. There are a lot of classicists and historians that have very polarized views um, regarding him. He uh, also has not been approached very much by authors as far as the main focus. And I thought it would be really interesting to maybe do, uh, you know, a trilogy with him as the focal center. And um, I started writing it 15 years ago, and before I did, I was trying to come up with who to write about. I thought about Cleopatra, but he, she has been done so many times and so well. In particular, my favorite Cleopatra book was by Margaret George. So I decided I would not touch her, just leave her put. Her story has been told many times. Um, Julius Caesar had just been tackled by several authors, and uh, so had Cicero as well. So I kept coming back to Antony and he had the military 
career. He had, of course, the romance with Cleopatra, among other women. <laughs> and I thought he would be really, really interesting and intriguing and uh, an adventure, truly, to write about. Um, nobody's really captured him, especially as a youth, especially as a child. And I started when his father had died and when he was 11 years old. So hopefully that is reason enough for people to be drawn into the story because they want to learn more about him. What was he like before Cleopatra? So. So you just mentioned that this book is the third in a trilogy. Can you give us kind of the trilogy in a nutshell? Sure. Like I said, the first one, Antonius, son of Rome, begins when he's 11 years old and um, follows him until he's about 27 when he actually meets Cleopatra for the very first time. Uh, the next book takes off shortly after that. Um, he has returned to Rome and he is finally called by Julius Caesar to join him in Gaul. And of course, Julius Caesar at the time was involved in the Gallic conquest and Antony joins him towards the very end of it. Um, and you know, one thing leads to another, of course, Caesar in, uh, winds up at war, uh, civil war with Pompeius Magnus, his former son-in-law and uh, Caesar wins. And after that, uh, Caesar becomes involved with Cleopatra, of course. And then he's killed on the Ides of March, and my story ends after um, the Battle of Philippi. And I'm not going to say much about that. I'll let everybody read the book. Um, my third book that's coming out and launching tomorrow is going to begin right after the Battle of Philippi. So, so the third book, Antonius, the Soldier of Fate, what makes that one more unique or thrilling? Um, I think... Again, it's from Antony's perspective. And, you know, we've heard Cleopatra's perspective so many times. We've heard Caesar, well, not Caesar's, but Octavian's perspective. Um, he does become Augustus Caesar. Um, and Antony has a very fresh perspective. He suffered a great deal before his death um, with a propaganda war that was horrific. And before that, he tried to conquer Parthia. And again, I'm not going to let too many cats out of the bag here because I want folks to read my work. But um, it, it's a very, very in-depth story. Um, because I turned it into a trilogy with the advice of my editor, you know, it was excellent advice. And I was able to really get down deep into his thoughts, his, you know, his, his personality. Um, and where he was headed. Um, you know, I really believe that he and Cleopatra did have a plan. We don't know exactly what that plan was, obviously. Uh, that part of history has been eradicated. So anyway. That's great. So you're a um, historical fiction writer. So for you, where does um, fiction begin and history end? Ooh, that's, that's dicey. Um, I think, as a historical writer, period, you do have to have your ducks in a row. Your research needs to be very, very well done. And of course, the, the research that I began with was simply research through the primary sources, people like Plutarch, who wrote probably the most complete story on Mark Antony, um, people like um, Tacitus, people like uh, Livy, people like Oh, Appian of Alexandria, he's, he's a good one. Um, Josephus is a good one. Um, all of these primary sources were a wealth of information. Uh, some of them are full of propaganda as well. You have to kind of mm, think about where they were writing from, what period they were writing from. Plutarch, for instance, wrote 100 years after Antony's death. He probably had some phenomenal resources but at the same time, you know, he was also in an imperial age, um, I think under the reign of Domitian at the time, and how much freedom he had in writing things, who knows, you know, what the political scene was like for him and where he wrote, who knows. So there are a lot of things to think about. There were some excellent secondary resources that I used. Um, in particular, um, Eleanor uh, Goltz-Hussar and, oh, what was her name? 
Patricia Southern uh, wrote a phenomenal um, biography on Antony. I, I have to say where the fiction takes off is again, what kind of propaganda was out there? Uh, Antony's story was written by his enemies. And so, you know, that leaves a lot of liberty um, for an author such as myself to take off with and have fun with. And I did that hopefully um, discreetly and, and hopefully people aren't gonna really know where the fiction begins and the history ends. So that's my hope. Yeah, so it is clear that you do a lot of research um, going into this writing. Do you have to travel at all for your research? Yeah, I got to, <laughs> and it was fantastic. Um, I have been to Rome about five or six times. Um, and, you know, when I travel to Rome, I'm looking for totally different things. My husband is staring at the Colosseum, and I'm looking at the sewers of Rome, the Cloaca Maxima, you know, so we're looking at different things for different reasons. And of course, I'm thinking like an author and he's, he's just look, looking for the glory that was Rome. Um, so, you know, I, I've been to Egypt as well. I went back in 08 before the revolution that they had. Um, it was phenomenal, probably the most exciting trip that I took um, in this book experience. And also I went to uh, Greece several times and oh my goodness, that was incredible. Um, I, I had to go literally all over Greece because Antony went all over Greece. And I'm talking about from Macedonia, which is on the far Eastern coast in the Northern part of the country, all the way West to the Peloponnese. And uh, he sailed all around Greece and um, of course the Battle of Actium uh, the big naval, naval battle that will be in my final book uh, took place on the western coast of Greece there. And uh, Philippi uh, was in Macedonia in the far northeast corner. Uh, Thessaly, which is in kind of the central part of Greece, um, on the plains, uh, is where Julius Caesar um, and Antony together, along with some other generals, fought Pompey and won. So again, all over Greece. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. I can see that Eugene really enjoys traveling with you or yeah. you know, <laughs> your work, he gets to travel. It's a nice That's story. right. Um, tell me about um, writing. What for you is the most challenging part of the writing process? Um, there's a lot of challenging things about writing. I think for me, um, the initial getting through the first draft manuscript, I tend to, I'm OCD. And I tend to want to go back, but I forced myself to just move forward and uh, get through the first draft so that I can go back and then it starts getting really fun and you add things and take things away and it's a blast. I love that part. Um, I think the second thing that's difficult for me is the final formatting process because when you have that manuscript in your hands after it's been formatted and you know that this is the last time you're going to be able to make any changes. I just, oh my gosh, that's nerve wracking for me. So <laughs> that, that's probably the most difficult part, I would say. Sure. Um, you mentioned earlier that your editor helped you work on the trilogy. Um, a lot of writers are afraid of that editing process. Are you afraid of that? No. In fact, I have to say, and she's here tonight, so later I'll get to uh, introduce her. But... Uh, Jenny is amazing. She is such a good editor. She, she's very patient with me, um, but yet she lets me know what she thinks needs to happen. And, you know, that's the type of person you need. Um, you've got to have somebody you can really trust. For me, the editing part, especially the developmental edit, which comes first, is my favorite part of the entire writing process. And I waited to say that until we got to this question because I absolutely love the developmental edit. It, cha it challenges me as a writer. It makes me uh, see more where the work, the, you know, the book I'm working on is going and construct construction wise, um, plot, character, everything. It just starts falling into place and it's so exciting to see that happen. Um, when you see where the book is going and where it's finally going to wind up after that developmental edit, it, everything becomes clear and it's, I love it. It's my favorite part of the whole process. <laughs> yeah. Um, so once that, once that initial manuscript's done, 
right? Mm -hmm. Then we move into the publishing process. What part of the publishing process is difficult for you or why is it difficult? Formatting, <laughs> I think I mentioned before. Yeah. It, to me, it's just really stressful. Um, it was especially so this time, um, there were some incidents that took place that I had no control over, illnesses, um, and you know you can't control that type of thing. Uh, if people are ill or if people are in the hospital, there's nothing you can do. You just have to stand back, give it to God, and move forward. And uh, so literally, I just got my final, my, my first print copy tonight, literally. And um, I told Dor Dolores, it was kind of funny, I was driving down the road chasing the UPS truck so but <laughs> before he went into another neighborhood so that I could get him before, you know, it got too late. So anyway, I have it and it turned out beautiful. And um, anyway, but that's definitely the most stressful part for me formatting. Yeah. Um, tell me, have you had any hurdles as far as achieving credibility when it comes to um, this industry? Yeah. Um, you know, the nice thing about being a member of the Historical Novel Society is that you meet so many people, you get a lot of good advice. Of course, you get some bad advice too, but you get a lot of great advice. And uh, there's an interviewer who has been interviewing me sporadically for the past year and a half since this whole journey started. And uh, her name is Patsy Gill. And um, she was kind of uh, brought into the picture by Margaret George, um, my friend. and author so she she gave me some um some goals to to try to achieve and um i'm very pleased to say that i've reached a few of them um first of all she said try to get your book onto a bestseller list on amazon and um internationally in the canada and um Great Britain, no, not Great Britain, Australia. Australia and Canada, I have been number one several times now um, in subgenres, which is really exciting. Uh, I was number three in the US for the very first time. I was in the top five for the very first time this past week, and I was so excited about that. Um, haven't hit number one yet in the, new, in the US, but it's, it's exciting. It's, it, it will happen someday, I guess. Um, and she said, try to win an award if you can. And you know, that does give you some credibility. Um, and I did this past uh, September, I was stunned. I took a silver medal um, uh, for the reader's favorite book reviewers awards, um, which is an international book award. And it's open to both traditionally published as well as uh, independently published authors. So anyway, I was really excited about that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that is great, Brooke. What's next for you? Where well, do you go from here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty excited because um, I am going to take a break from ancient Rome for a while. Um, I, it's definitely a period of history that I am in love with, and I will definitely return. I already kind of know who I want to write on. But at the same time, um, I want to take a break and I want to work on something closer to home. And I'm going to um, explore the history of uh, early, the 19th, early 19th century in Fincastle, Virginia, which is in, here in Botetourt County, where I live, the county seat. And um, I, there's a beautiful mansion called Santa Lane uh, here in Botetourt County. And Kurt, you know it well. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to be writing the story of Santa Lane and um, the Hancock family who originally lived there. And Julia, who was known as Judy Hancock, married William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And I'm going to be telling that story and the story of Finn Castle of that period. So can't That's wait. Great. <laughs> There's a lot of rich history there that I've learned so far about it. Yeah, um, there really is. So that means not a lot of traveling, huh? Are you gonna travel <laughs> back to Rome at all? Yeah, right now anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right, right. Nobody's traveling. <laughs> I know Eugene doesn't get to travel much anymore, sorry. <laughs> what can you do? Uh, Brooke, that's all the questions that I had for you today. All right, well, well I thanks. think- I really appreciate your time. Oh, uh, I, I appreciate you doing this for me, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I, I think we're going to have uh, a bit of a reading right here. Um, 
uh, would you like to introduce your reader? Uh, it's me, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. And I'm going to hold this up because here it is. It came today, finally, so I'm pretty excited about it. And um, I am going to read, this isn't the very beginning, but um, it's close to the beginning. And uh, it's just about two pages, so it's, it's not too terribly long. <clears throat> this takes place, uh, the scene is a marketplace, a market square in the ancient city of Tarsus, which is, uh, or was, in Turkey. And uh, I don't know what ruins are there now. Gordana probably does, she's here. So um, I don't know what's left of Tarsus, if you can visit any of the ancient city, but anyway, here we go. Marcus swatted it, annoying flies, wishing for a stiff breeze. For the better part of the morning, he'd been sitting in Tarsus's town center in full togate glory, hearing grievances, holding audiences for supplicants, and judging personal quarrels between locals. A large canopy shielded him from the sun. Fortunately, he was hearing the day's last case, a murder trial concerning a wealthy caravan owner accused by his Syrian father-in-law of murdering his bride. As the girl's father testified, Marcus noticed a flurry of activity at the far end of the marketplace. People were turning away from his deliberations and scurrying off in large throngs towards the Sidmus River docks. Find out what's going on back there, Canidius, Marcus ordered. If there's a civic disturbance, put an end to it. Canidius nodded curtly, departing with armed legionaries to get answers as more and more people left. Moments later, Eros came bounding across the court, hopping up the stairs of Marcus's platform two at a time. It's Queen Cleopatra, he whispered excitedly. Her ship's docking as I speak. You can see it from the palace ramparts. Marcus stared speechlessly at his slave, then glanced again toward the river. So many citizens were emptying the marketplace now that Tarsus's merchants were even closing shops. Tersely postponing the trial, he left the square, ascending the stairs to the Seleucid palace's walls. When Delius had returned from Alexandria a month ago, he had reported that Egypt's queen had not responded well to Marcus's summons. Vague and off-putting, she'd made excuses about her many duties and how her presence in Egypt was required. It had irritated Marcus. They had always shared a good rapport previously, and he'd expected better cooperation. As his eyes sought the docks where the murky Sidnus threaded lazily by, they beheld a welcome sight. A magnificent vessel was docking at the center of the marina. Thousands of people were waving and moving about, vying for better views atop trees and buildings. But that ship, Marcus had never seen anything like it. Resplendent in the afternoon sun, the entire prow was gilded. Oars were raised vertically on both sides, still wet and glistening, each richly tipped in silver. Since Cleopatra was purposefully making a spectacle, the sails remained raised, each a rich dark purple. Marcus couldn't begin to imagine the numbers of murex shellfish needed for the dye. Stitched into the mainsail was an enormous gold embossed eye of Horus, the insignia of the ship's owner, Royal Egypt. Canidius rejoined Marcus, winded from his jaunt through town. Look at it, Marcus gestured, grinning. Then try and tell me she can't send us all to Parthia and back 50 times. Canidius clapped him on the back. Let's just hope victory doesn't take that many trips. Marcus nodded in amused agreement, but then sobered. You know, if she gets off that boat, there could be trouble. She may not realize how desperately poor these people are. Send Delius with a cohort to officially greet her and control the crowd, and I'll invite her to dine with us tonight. Canidius had just left to find Delius when Eros reappeared. I always liked her, he murmured, gazing approvingly down at the sight, a gentle smile playing on his lips. Really? I wasn't aware you two were all that well acquainted, Marcus chided. Should I plan an extra place at the head dining couch for you? Eros shook his head. She wouldn't remember me, Dominus. I'm only a slave. And I was just a cavalry officer when we first met, Marcus said. Well, now you're Imperator and the most powerful man alive. And this was just delivered from her boat. Eros extended a small, elegant scroll cylinder. 
Marcus examined it careful, carefully, smiling at the seal's graceful sphinx imprint. Made of ivory, the canister bore a lovely hieroglyphic inscription filled with black enamel. He slid his thumb beneath the purple ribbon, snapping open the top. With a single finger tap, out dropped the little scroll of the finest papyrus. Her script was small and concise, lettered in Greek, and as he read, he caught a faint scent of lotus. Cleopatra VII Philopater, queen of the two lands, Isis incarnate, and friend and ally of the Roman people to Marcus Antonius, Imperator and Triumvir. Salutations. I invite you and your staff to board my ship and feast in my company tonight at sundown. Egypt shall rejoice to greet her Roman friends once more. I await your arrival. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure if everybody wasn't muted, they'd be clapping right now. So you can assure yourself there's applause out there. Uh, now, you had some special friends you wanted to uh, introduce. Uh, I think the most of them did get logged on. Okay. So if you want to go ahead, we'll try to bring them up as you mention them. Okay. And um, I see I have a second page here, so I may scroll over in a minute. Um, First of all, I do want to introduce my husband. Actually, he goes by the name Carlton, not Eugene, but that's okay. And Carlton um, has really been patient and just a real champion through all of this because it's taken me 15 years to write this story. So <laughs> Carlton, thank you, hon. You are awesome. <laughs> so anyway, um, I also want to introduce a very, very dear friend of mine. Make sure that Dear friend of mine, as well as, let's see, make sure I do this right. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yes, um, my, my editor, I'm so glad she's here. <laughs> Her name is Jennifer Quinlan. Um, she goes by Jenny Q and she's waving at the camera. So anyway, Jenny is phenomenal. She has been so patient with me and taught me so many things. And not only is she my editor, but she is also my phenomenal cover designer. So all of my beautiful color covers, uh, Jenny has, has put together and we usually have a, a heart to heart chat um, via email to discuss what we're trying to achieve in a cover. And it's just such a fun part of the creative process. Um, at least I think it is, I think she does too. <laughs> and um, anyway, she's also the Historical Novel Society uh, Conference Chair this year. Um, for the upcoming conference that I'm crossing both my fingers and my toes um, that we get to have. So anyway, um, I don't know if Catherine is here. I'm looking to see if she is. Catherine Myrick, yes, she's here. Catherine, I wanted to introduce you. She is one of my beta readers. You know, it takes kind of a village to raise a child, they say, and it takes a village to write a book too. <laughs> and um, Catherine uh, lives in Australia, right? And so we're delighted, delighted to have her with us. And I thank her for coming. Um, Sharon Doan, I don't know if Sharon's here or not, but I wanted to mention her. She's also one of my beta readers, as well as Sarah Penner. And um, I think Sarah is here, but probably not on the screen. I'm not sure. But anyway, Sarah is a very excited upcoming author. Her debut novel will uh, be coming out this March and it's going to be a phenomenal read. It's called The Lost Apothecary. So I encourage everybody to go out and get it when it comes out. It's a great book. It is a great book. I've read it. It's wonderful. Yes, Dolores has read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, Gordana Maruzzi is here. And Gordana is just incredible. She is one of my two guides in Greece. And Gordana um, showed me the area around Actium, as well as um, Corfu, her own, her own island. She gets her own island. <laughs> and Gordana is just a joy to be around. Uh, Carlton got to meet her last summer as well. And oh my goodness, we just had such a wonderful reunion. Um, but Gordana was able to get me into some places 
that were difficult to access, um, archaeological archeolo sites that were difficult to access. One is Nicopolis, um, where Octavian's war memorial was, and um, it, it was just a phenomenal day. Uh, we, we, gosh, we rode and walked all over Nicopolis, saw the ancient ruins of the city, and I do have some very, very special memories about that whole, that whole day was phenomenal. So, um, is Ioannis here? I'm not sure if he made it or not, but no, he didn't make it, okay. He was another guide, uh, he showed me around Filippi, and um, he was hoping to come tonight, but I guess it didn't quite work out. Um, and I have another um, very special person that I have been dying to, in to introduce since um, we first got on. Um, she is, she's my hero. <laughs> And that is um, New York Times bestselling author Margaret George is with us tonight. And um, she is just a very, very dear, special person to me, uh, sort of became my mentor in this whole process. Um, she and I are, are very fond of Mark Antony. Um, he's our special friend. <laughs> and um, it was just kind of unusual how we met. I just felt very strongly one day that I needed to thank her for writing the memoirs of Cleopatra because I've read it, all 900 pages, I've read three times. And uh, I, I decided I would send her an email. Of course, I needed to do that through her agent. And within a few weeks, we were writing back and forth like old friends. And suddenly she was writing from her personal email <laughs> instead of her agent. And we've become dear friends. So Margaret, thank you so much for your support. And <laughs> you are a well-loved lady. So. Uh, I also have some, we have a very international crowd tonight, and I just needed to share that. Um, of course, we have Gordana from Greece, and we have Catherine Myrick from um, Australia. We also have uh, Fatima. She's not pinned. Don't worry, Suede. You don't need to worry. But uh, Fatima is also in Australia and is watching tonight, too. Uh, Chris Bezos is in Canada. Oh, my goodness. Um, Gosh, I think we've got another Canadian here. If I can find her, I'm looking. Marion, there's Marion. Hi, Marion. <laughs> She's waving at me. Um, oh my goodness gracious. My cousins Delane and Dan are here. It's great to see them. <laughs> and um, nice to have a cheering section there. And um, anyway, I just really, Appreciate. Oh, Baptiste from France is here. <laughs> Bonsoir. <laughs> Qu'est-ce qui se passe? Anyway, it's good to see him here as well. Um, like I said, it takes a lot of people um, supporting you as an author, cheering you on, and um, it's been such an amazing journey. I can't believe I've written a trilogy. Wow. <sighs> so, thank you. Okay. Thank you for introducing all those friends. You did have a village behind you. I did. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a good lesson for any of us who aspire to be a published author. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some questions. Uh, we had some questions sent in early and then uh, we've had some posted in the chat. If anybody has a question, be sure to put it in the chat and we'll get to it here in a second. Uh, let's see, we have one from Laura and she says that uh, how do you feel about manipulating history and compressing it to make it work in a narrative? Okay. Um, actually, was that Dan Scannell's question? It seemed like maybe it was. Well, this one says Laura. Does it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, you know, as a historian... Oh, wait a minute. It is from Dan, but it's Laura's email. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive me. I thought it was Dan's. Anyway, hi, Dan. It's good to see you here. Um, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question, so let me know if I didn't do a good job answering, okay? Um, from what you're asking, you know, first of all, we have to all remember that as, as an author, I'm a historical fiction author. Um, so just kind of like what Kurt and I were talking about earlier, there is a point in time at, at, well, in, the, in the novel process where the history ends and you've got to throw in some fiction. And whether or not you compress it to fulfill a plot device, I think it depends. I think you just have to be careful about doing it so that it's appropriate. 
so that it doesn't mar the existing story, the extant history that we do know about. I think you have to do it in a very subtle way, if that helps. Um, and again, I hope I answered that sufficiently. But as a, as a historical fiction author, you know, no, yes, history is my base, and I try to make it as accurate as I can. But, you know, when I don't have material, I have to invent. Um, Son of Rome was the one where I had to do that the most because, you know, there isn't much known about Antony's youth or, you know, his, his childhood. Um, so I was able to use some events such as the Spartacan Rebellion, such as the Catiline Conspiracy, to kind of create fill there and develop a plot around that. And um, that was really fun, actually. <laughs> that was really fun. Thank you for that. We, uh, those of us in Virginia, always get really tickled with Disney versions of things. Uh, Pocahontas, uh, if you've ever been to Jamestown, Virginia, you're still looking for that waterfall. Not sure where the ground got high enough to be a waterfall. It's mostly <laughs> So we appreciate your attention to detail. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions here um, from Pam O'Shea. If you could go back in time and meet Mark Antony, what would you ask him or what would you say to him? Oh, Pam, I've been thinking about this one all day because Dolores was nice enough to send it. And I thought about several different things. Um, I, I think the thing that I would want to know the most about was what exactly were his and Cleopatra's plan? You know, I would want to know more definitively what were they really trying to accomplish? What was their goal? Um, you know, were they going to split the capitals between Rome and Alexandria? Were they going to uh, just have Rome as the capital or just Alexandria? That type of thing. Um, yeah. Would she rule in Egypt while he ruled in Rome? You know, what if they had won? What would it have looked like? Um, I think I would have had that kind of conversation with him because, you know, as an author, and I'm, and I'm trying to write on his behalf, I'm trying to decide what exactly were their goals? What were they trying to do politically there? Um, boy, I'll bet Margaret George has some things to add to this too, but <laughs> I don't know if you can turn her mic on, but she's welcome to take off where I am here. So, but no, you don't know either. <laughs> okay. No. Um, Pam also asked that uh, because uh, modern life is so different from the culture and society in Mark Antony's time, uh, do you think it makes it hard for people to, today to understand really the way that society worked, in particular slavery? Yeah, I think in our political landscape right now, there are some people who do struggle with that. Um, and without divulging, you know, my personal opinion too much, I'm just going to state, I think some people take a very uneducated look at it. Um, because, you know, slavery is not necessarily all about the color of people's skin, historically. You know, in Roman times, you could be any race. Uh, you could be any uh, nation that had been subjugated by the Romans and you were taken into slavery. You could be white, you could be uh, Latin looking, you could be uh, Greek, you could, you could be from North Africa, you could be from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it, it really didn't matter. Um, I think America, Mm, and I guess I have to be careful here because I'm not specialized in the history of slavery, although in our nation, certainly, um, you know, the American, the, 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 the black Americans were certainly subjugated unfairly to slavery. We can all agree that it was a horrible thing, horrible all the way back to ancient Rome, to ancient Egypt, and, and prior to that. I don't think slavery is a new thing by any means. Um, and it certainly, through history, has not necessarily been cast upon one race. I hope that helps. Okay. Um, what do you think is the most misunderstood historical aspect of Mark Antony? Um, 
Boy, that's a good question too. Um, I think that that again, his you know his whole history was written by his enemies. So any of his his views, his his likes, his dislikes, you know, we we actually know very little about him. Um, you know, we don't even know for sure some of the busts, you know, statuary of, of one's face really belongs to him because all of his statues um, were destroyed, his inscriptions were chiseled out because of Damnatio Memoriae, um, you know, under the regime of Augustus. So, you know, I, I, I it, it, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say, you know, what, what would we think of him? I don't know, maybe he wasn't such a nice person. You know, in my books, I try to give him the benefit of the doubt a lot because he is my main character. But at the same time, he he was no different than some other Romans and did some terrible things. You know, um, you know, the thought of killing one sibling, you know, Cleopatra did that, and he did it for her at one point. And that's that's just a horrible thing to think about. But that was the way history was at that time. Uh, when you had powerful people who were kings and queens, you know, you had to protect yourself and to protect your interests. You acted very differently than we would, you know, in our day and age now. So um, again, I don't know if I answered that question well, but I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Um, the re these questions are uh, maybe jump around a little bit, but we'll go through them, uh, the order they're on here. Uh, you mentioned the book um, about Santa Lane. Uh, have you thought about writing any more historic fiction and what period would you want to write on? Yeah, um, well, definitely my next one is going to be early 19th century, um, around the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which I believe, I don't have my dates in front of me here, but around 1804 to 1806, something in there. Um, also, you know, Thomas Jefferson was very much involved in that um, part of history. And so I'm really looking forward to learning more about our area here in Virginia. It's really going to be awesome to do that. So um, I do want to return to Rome. I do have an idea in mind for my next uh, biographical historical fiction novel set in Rome. And um, it's not going to be so far afield from the trilogy that I've just completed. So that's going to be fun. It's going to be in the Augustan age. So um, most of it is anyway. And, uh, you know, I've got some other ideas. I'm, I'm very interested in my grandmother. Um, she homesteaded to the state of Montana before it was a state. Um, and she had to prove up her property, uh, she and her husband, uh, to prove that it was arable farmland and they had to prepare the land and it was horrifically difficult. Um, she used to tell my father stories about 60 below zero temps, um, you know, grizzly bears coming onto their property at night, uh, packs of wolves. Uh, it was crazy. Um, you know, there were some very unsavory types, gunmen, you know, in the area, things like that. So um, I, I'm also interested in maybe writing her story. So. Oh, no, that'd be fun for a couple of relatives. I'd like to do that for as well. Yeah. Okay, we have one uh, that refers back to your second book, um, specifically the uh, um, part about divorce in the Roman way. Could women divorce men as easily as men could divorce women? Ooh, goodness gracious. I need my Oxford Classical Dictionary. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Margaret George, do you know? I, I'll be honest, I'd have to look it up. I would have to look that up. I don't really know either. I, I think <laughs> that, I think that um, both could divorce each other, but it is like everything else, it was probably much more difficult for women. Um, yeah. I finally figured out how to unmute myself here. So <laughs> and didn't before about the other question, but now I figured out how to do it. No, I, I think I think so, but I Mm, wouldn't swear on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm not certain, and um, that's an excellent question. Um, I know that when it came to, and this is more my third book, but the Confariatio 
style of marriage that it's believed that Antony entered into with Octavia, Octavian's sister. Um, that was the highest degree of, of marriage because they, there were different levels of marriage in Roman culture. And uh, confariatio was extremely difficult to extricate oneself from, whether you were male or female. So, you know, a divorce for confariatio was considered almost to be cursed by the gods. You know, you just didn't do that if it was a confariatio marriage. So, anyway. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, you've got a lot of good wishes on here. We'll make sure you get this chat Aww. session. So <laughs> let's see what we have here. Um, okay, this question, I'm gonna read it just as it's posed here. Do you, as a historian, whoops, where to go? It, feel that the past and its history is capable of being true and correct, or is it closer to a fabricated narrative? Is there some fiction in our history? Oh, yeah. Well, you, you have propaganda, you know, that's written in history. Um, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, for example, um, historians believe is full of propaganda. They even wonder sometimes about his numbers. Um, I was just, where's Marion's here somewhere, and I'm thinking, <laughs> where's Marion? I'm trying to wave at her or something. Anyway, um, she was talking about the Gallic Wars last week, and Supposedly, there were anywhere from 160 to 200,000 Gauls attacking the Romans, and you know during the Gallic, the final Gallic conquest at Elysia, and you know whether or not those numbers were completely accurate, it's really hard to say. Um, I used the higher number, you know, 200,000, but you know I know that Mary in, in her work is using the lower number, 160 for her use, again, because she, she wanted a lower number. So, you know, I, you, you can't always say, especially uh, even, even as I start my research for, you know, 200 years ago in Virginia history, you're going to find some stuff that is just lacking. You know, there's nothing there. Um, sometimes historical records can be real dicey to to feed through, to microscopically go through and decide what is correct. Um, Suetonius is probably my favorite writer to read from the Roman period. And he reads like the Ancient People magazine. Um, you know, that's where we learned that um, Augustus Caesar, Octavian, wore elevator sandals. And he also had big ears, you know. <laughs> But, you know, Suetonius wrote that kind of stuff down. Isn't it a good thing he did, you know? It makes these people more human. But again, you know, how much of it was real? How much of it should we really believe? It's, it's, sometimes it is hard to say, you know? But that's what we have. So we use it as authors. Oh, yes. We use okay, it. here's another question that's uh, your opinion on how that history played out. Do you think Antonia, Antonius outstrategized by... Octavian, or was it just bad luck? Hmm. Um, I think that if anyone, I, I think that Antony was a fairly sound tactician, especially on the battlefield. You know, he, he kind of fought with his gut feeling. Um, he was nothing like Caesar and nothing like Octavian. Caesar was one of these people that would plan for several years down the road kind of what he was going to do. Antony was not like that. He was more off the cuff, which kind of crippled him in the end. Um, Octavian was ruthless. And, and, you know, you would think that any of these guys are ruthless to a certain extent. And he was, and, and all of them were. But I think that Octavian was the king of ruthless. I think even more so than Cleopatra. Um, she could be ruthless at times. Uh, look what she did to her sister. She had to. Um, look what she possibly did to her brothers. We don't know for sure. Um, but I, I, I don't think Antony was stupid. I don't think he was a drunkard. I think he drank. You know, I think he was a binge drinker. Um, whether he was an actual alcoholic is another story. Um, there are times when he was certainly down on his luck and he drank himself into a stupor. And maybe that's alcoholism, you know. Um, but at the same time, he did, 
he did some very courageous, bold things and made some very clear decisions. When Octavian Augustus uh, went into the East after Antony and Cleopatra died and took over, he made very few changes. You know, what was working there for Antony worked for him. So again, you know, Antony was very clear-sighted in some ways. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> okay, uh, one other one. This one, um, um, I don't know uh, if you want to do a spoiler or not, because of course, <laughs> no, there, only a few people on here have read your book. Do Antony and uh, Cleopatra's children show up in this book? And you can say yes or no and leave it at that if you want. Yes, they do. Okay. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> okay, great. Well, did um, Anthony and Cleopatra love each other or was it just a um, wedding of convenience? Okay. I'm, that's interesting that you asked that. I don't know who, do, do you know who asked that question? That's a great question. Let's see. Fatima. <gasps> Fatima. Okay. Did Fatima. I say your name right? <laughs> anyway, Fatima. Um, I, I hate to answer it because I want you guys to read the book and enjoy the experience. <laughs> but if you want, I did write a blog on this very question just this week. And um, Fatima, I will post it on, on my Facebook site. How's that? Okay. Okay. So instead of answering it here, I'm thinking it might be more relevant for you to actually read what I wrote. Tanya, did you read it? Yeah, you may have. It, Li Elizabeth St. John posted it yesterday. So I will, I will definitely put that on my Facebook feed for you. Is that good, okay. Fatima? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll have one more question here. And um, when you do your writing, when do you stop and start writing? Do they overlap? And how has your um, research changed as more and more stuff is available on the internet? Oh, wow. Okay, let's, let's start with the first part of that. Could you reread re the first part of that again? That's a long question. <laughs> yeah, when does your research stop and your writing begin? Does it overlap? Okay, you know, I think I was pretty anal with this book because it was my, you know, my, my first works. Um, and again, I spent 15 years on this. So you know, a lot of my research kind of bled into my writing time, which really, you know, sometimes you do need to go look things up while you're writing. You really do, um, because you want to be accurate as possible. But at the same time, you know, sometimes you have to set it aside and say, okay, I've got to just dive into this and do it, get it done. And um, so, yeah, I do spend a lot of research time, but now the you know, as I get into this more and more, I'm finding that there's a point where I just have to sit down, set my sources aside, and just jump right in and focus on it. And, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean I can't come back to, you know, research materials. I think it's important that we authors stay right on the tip of the most recent, you know, studies or research out there. And the cool thing is about the classical world, is stuff is being found constantly. You know, you know, look what they, they found in Rome over the past several decades, you know, the Domus Aurea, Holy Mo, you know, who knew that that was under that hillside? And there's this amazing, you know, old palace that was destroyed, but parts of it are still able to be visited by guests today. So, you know, there's stuff being found constantly, which is so exciting. Um, and the second part of that question again, Dolores, please. Has your research method, you've been doing this a long time, um, changed as more and more stuff has been become available on the internet? Um, yes and no, because you know what? There is nothing better to me when I'm researching than having an open book and being able to really, I hate to say, but highlight it and write in it and make notes to myself. You know, I, I have got several books that are just all marked up. I mean, some of you I know are going, <gasps> you shouldn't do that, you know, but for me, it helps because I write myself notes. Oh, I need to make sure that I include this in the chapter, thus and such. 
I need to make sure that I bring this out in so-and-so's character. You know, that really helps me a lot. Um, internet research, well, it's good if you find reliable sources, but you also have to sift through things. You have to be careful, especially with history, because sometimes you'll have a very skewed source. You know, um, I'm trying to think of my, maybe something that would be a good, good example. Um, but, you, you know, you want to get something that isn't necessarily politically skewed or culturally skewed. You want to have as, as fair uh, a presentation as you can um, of the facts. So for me, I, I, I do use the internet. You know, Wikipedia can be a good thing at times. Um, but I tell you what, when it comes to verifying dates and relationships and who married who and this kind of stuff, Oxford Classical Dictionary for me, you know, when I'm writing about Rome, you can't beat it. Um, you know, things like that. Eleanor Holtzkoot Czar, um, who wrote the secondary biography, one of them, Pat Southern on Antony. You know, those were the types of sources that I really, really thrived upon. Those in the ancient sources. Ancient sources. I can't talk. So. Brooke, thank you so much for doing this tonight. We've been really glad to hear about all this. And I know everybody, including me, is anxious to read the third in the trilogy. Um, we want to thank everybody who helped put this together. Kurt, you for um, doing our interview there. And my assistant here in the store, Sway Best. I do want to encourage you to follow the links in the uh, uh, chat file there. And please help support your local independent bookstore. Uh, by clicking on that. We'll also send out um, uh, these links and an email to everyone who re uh, registered. And as soon as we have it um, edited, we bet we'll put the video of this event on our website as well. And hopefully we'll send each of you a link. Um, hope everybody uh, has read the first two books. If you haven't, please start with those. And uh, I guess that's all for tonight. Do you have any parting words, Brooke? Well, um you know, we're going to get these ordered as soon as we can, for those of you who did, you know, place an order. And did you want to say anything about that, Dolores, as far as the time and how, how that Yeah, um, uh, the, essentially the books have been released today or as of tomorrow. So we will, assuming that they're available for us to order, those of you who have ordered online and any of those who'd still like to do that, we will get those and either make them available for pickup in the store or ship them out to you, whatever your preference is. And we hope to have them in here long enough for Brooke to come by and sign them so that you'll get an autographed copy, uh, which is something I don't think you'll get on that other place that you can <laughs> order books. You won't get a signed copy there. So you might want to hop over at our little spot there. And, uh, but I do want to thank everybody tonight and please uh, check our website for future events. We have these book launches pretty often and uh, would uh, appreciate any way you can support us. Thanks, Brooke.